right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone. It is so wonderful to see uh, so many faces. And uh, we really just want to thank you for taking the time to, to, to come out and spend with us this evening. So um, this is a program that we um, in the Michael C. Carlos Museum and in the Emory University Libraries are extraordinarily excited about. I know I personally have been waiting on this for a really, really long time. Um, and I'm just thrilled um, with the program that we have lined up for you this evening. So I just want to wish you a hearty welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Valida Dent. I am the new Vice Provost for the Emory University Libraries and the Michael C. Carlos Museum. Um, I've been here since. too kind and you know to be honest with you one of the reasons that I was drawn to Emory is because of programming like this that you will not find anywhere else um, and so we are both honored and blessed um, to be in the company of these in the company of these gentlemen here who I will introduce in just a few minutes but I do want to start by um, sharing with you Emory University's um, land acknowledgement. This is an, an important part of our DNA, and it's important to capture this, to share it, and then to reflect on it in, across all of our programming. And so let me just take a few minutes to read our land acknowledgement statement. So we acknowledge that Emory University was founded in 1836 on the historic lands of the Muscogee Creek Nation. 15 years after the first Treaty of Indian Springs in 1821, dispossessed the Muscogee of land, including both Emory campus locations. We acknowledge that Emory University's founders were slaveholders and that the Oxford campus was originally constructed by enslaved peoples. To these peoples and to their descendants, we acknowledge the grave injustices inflicted upon them, and we recognize the indelible mark of their labor on the creation of this university. So our, Ashe, thank you, thank you. Our program this evening is a collaboration between Emory University Libraries, the Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library and the Michael C. Carlos Museum. How many people have been to the museum? Okay, for everybody who didn't raise your hand, you have to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, many thanks to the Emory University Library's campus and community relations. I know my team is here in the audience and the Rose Library teams and the Carlos Museum staff for the roles that they have played in planning and promoting this event and creating the exhibitions and the exhibits um, that you all have been looking at. So can we just give them a round of applause? So this particular program is presented in partnership with the Atlanta Preservation Center's Phoenix Flies a celebration of Atlanta's historic sites. The program, which celebrates its 20th year anniversary this year, publicizes Atlanta organizations involved in the preservation and recording and the archiving of, the, of those efforts. The Rose Library and the Carlos Museum are among 90 Phoenix Flies partners. Our program celebrates the artists that you are about to hear from. And there are two related exhibits. So right outside this room in the Shatton Gallery is the brand new exhibit called Creative Justice, a celebration of Emory Arts and Social Justice Fellows Program. It was created by our program moderator, Carlton Mackey, who I'm going to introduce in a few minutes, um, and a curatorial assistant and former fellow of the Arts and Social Justice Fellow, Sierra King, where's Sierra? Sierra here? Okay, Sierra's not here tonight. Um, I hope that you have had a chance to see the exhibition already. Um, if you did, you will notice that our guest, Mr. Jim Alexander's work is featured in one of the quadrants of the exhibit. So if you didn't recognize that the first time, when you go back through, just look for that. 
We are very proud to have Jim Alexander's papers housed in our Rolls Library here in this very building. And you will be And you will be hearing much more about his works in the months and years to come. A true treasure. A very incomplete self-portrait. Tom Dorsey's Chicago portfolio at the Carlos Museum. So if you haven't seen that, you also have to circle to the Carlos so you can make sure to see uh, Tom's exhibition there. Um, was created by Carlos Museum curator of works on paper, Andy McKenzie. And I saw Andy, she's right there. And Andy worked with the Candler School of Theology uh, student, Anna Clark. Is Anna here? Um, and features Tom Dorsey's portfolio of black and white photographs taken while Dorsey was enrolled at the Art Institute of Chicago. I know that you will hear more about these exhibits during the conversation. Um, Tom's exhibit is open in the Carlos until July 16th, so you have plenty of time to see it. And the Creative Justice exhibit, um, which features Jim's work, will be open until May 14th. Now let me introduce our speakers for the evening. Our moderator, Carlton Mackey, is known by many of you. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Tuskegee University in 2000, his MDiv from Emory's Candler School of Theology in 2005. He started working for Emory Center for Ethics in 2006, as the Associate Director of the D. Abbott Turner Program in Ethics and Servant Leadership. And from 2010 until 2022, he served as Director for the Ethics and Art Program. In 2020, he became the Co-Director of the Arts and Social Justice Fellows Program. This is the program that's showcased in the exhibit outside in the Shatton Gallery. And along with Kev Kevin Carnes, who's now the Assistant Dean of the Arts at Emory College, uh, those two work together on the uh, Social Justice Fellows Program. In September of 2022, um, much to our dismay, I just have to throw that in there. Um, my Emory colleagues share the sentiment, um, but this is good for Carlton. Carlton became the Assistant Director of Community Dialogue and Engagement at Atlantis High Museum of Art. Yes. <laughs> but, but fortunately for us, he continues to be very, very engaged with Emory, and we are just so, so grateful for that. Um, Carlton is the creator of social media platforms and grassroots empowerment movements such as Beautiful in Every Shade and Black Men Smile. So welcome, Carlton. <laughs> so now it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mr. Jim Alexander. Jim is an award-winning documentary photographer who has spent many years refining what he calls the art of documentary photography. Jim started taking photographs in 1952 at the age of 17 when he was in the US Navy at a time when photography was not yet considered broadly as an art form. He had his first exhibit 16 years later in 1968 the same year he graduated from the New York Institute of Photography with a, a degree in commercial photography. Um, Alexander was a 2021 Arts and Social Justice Fellow at Emory. He has received multiple awards, including the 2021 Yvonne Dooley Art and Social Justice Lifetime Contribution Award. He is also a 2006 inductee into the History Makers. His work is in numerous major collections, including the Smithsonian, uh, the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. His work can also be found at Tigerland University Galleries Collection, and of course here in Emory's Rolls Library. The last line of Jim's bio on his website reads, the Jim Alexander Collection is a photographic progression through African-American music, through social struggle, through artistic expression, and the love 
one man has for his people and his love of social justice, which really sums up his life's work, I think, in a way that is just so appropriate. So welcome, Jim. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to all uh, Mr. Tom Dorsey. So Tom Dorsey is considered Atlanta's most notable photographer of African-American family portraits. His collection includes the families of Andrew Young, of Hank Aaron, Marvin Arrington Sr., and many, many others. So Tom was born in Augusta, Georgia, but he grew up in Chicago. And after a four year stint in the Air Force, he worked at the U.S. Post Office for over a decade. And then he became interested in art and pursued a degree in fine art from the Art Institute of Chicago. He fell in love with photography, which led him to start a business with his late wife, Carolyn. And this business was centered on family portrait portraiture, starting off in Chicago and then moving the business to Atlanta. In 2006, Tom had an epiphany that he should be helping children, and he soon founded a mentoring program for Black boys called Brother to Brothers. Um, this continues to be a passion of his today. We found this quote from Tom from an article about one of his photography exhibits. So, quote, there are many sides to all people, but there are more positive Visual self is the only one I try to see with my camera. I cannot say how one should view these images, but my photographs reflect the positive potential of the human spirit I saw every time I was given the opportunity to trip the shutter. Welcome, Tom. tired of listening to me. I'm going to turn it over to Carlton to start our program off. Welcome, Carlton. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I would like to start by just thanking you all for being here. And I'd like to offer a couple of other, a, a couple of other thanks. Um, I would love to thank the exhibitions team for their work in the show, Creative Justice, that is just outside of here. We invite you all to please um, look at it after our time together. It has been amazing working with um, each of you. So I just want to say, you know, shout you all by, by name, Kathy Dixon, who is here. Uh, John Quindle, who I do not see, and Christian Hill. Thank you all so much for all the work that you put into this exhibit and every exhibit that is amazing and mighty that is in that space. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Sierra King, who worked with me to create and curate this exhibit, who's not here, but if, if, if she were, even in her absence, please give her a, a, a <laughs> large round of applause. And Jackie Fritz, who is here, who um, there's nothing that we would be able to do with the Arts and Social Justice Fellows Program without Jackie, including putting up this exhibit where you caught every mistake that, um, that I made and hopefully got it cleared before it went up. And I'm so grateful for you and everything that you do for the Arts and Social Justice Fellows Program. Thank you so much. I, am, I have the distinct honor of sitting here with, as I said, whenever I posted about tonight's conversation with, 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 with two legends. Um, and it is a distinct pleasure just to be here to be talking to you and to be listening to you. And as I've gotten a chance to talk to you before, I know that there's so much wisdom that you have. There's so many stories that you can tell um, that it would take us hours and hours and hours to, to tell them all, which we do not have. Um, so I'm going to invite you all to think with me um, and to invite you all to listen around three major ideas. And I'll, I'll invite us to have a conversation around really three major points that I'd like to guide our conversation tonight. One of them is bearing witness. So I'll ask a couple questions about, about this, this, this phrase of bearing witness. The other is seeking justice. 
I'd like for that to be the kind of second area that we explore in our conversation. And the third is around providing guidance. So around bearing witness, that is really a conversation about your photography and what it points to, the, the witness that it bears, the truth that it tells. I'd like for us, the seeking justice is really around leveraging your work and the ways that you engage your work around doing the work of justice, connecting art and social justice. And the third around providing guidance is really for both of you, which I've, I've learned and I've been the beneficiary of what is important to both of you, which is mentorship. So the, I'd like for us to close um, in really talking about the, that role in your life and the importance that it plays in shaping your understanding of, of yourself. Um, so bear witness, let's start with, 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 with that, shall we? Um, Could I get something out of my bag? You absolutely, absolutely, man. Um, <laughs> so uh, as, as I'll, I'll set this question up to say that in my role, um, I remember another conversation that I, that I was a part of. I was actually on the panel, and they, and they were talking about photography as witness, and we were talking about the ethics of photography. And the conversation went to exploring the idea, kind of modeling the notion that documentary photography is the truth, that when we take images that are of real life, life subjects, and we call them documentary photography, that, we're, that, we're, that, that what people are looking at is the truth. And the challenge was to say that photography is never objective. It always has some of the, it always has some of the photographer in it. Um, and the photographer is making decisions to, to, to curate what they show. Um, but I, I like to say that even if it is not telling the truth, it may bear witness to it. It may point to it. Um, and you, both of your work in many ways is bearing witness to something. I, um, and I, I, I'd like to start by asking you both this question. What does, what does the idea, what does the notion, what does the phrase bearing witness mean to you and to your work? Um, and what is it that you believe is central that you are bearing witness to? through your photography. And neither of you could, could go first. I think we, uh, you, we, we'll, 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 we'll start with you. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a piece here that was on an exhibit that um, of some students of mine when I taught back in 77 and 78 at Clark College. And I saw one of my students in the room today. Hmm. He majored in what I started majoring in, which is psychology. There you go. <laughs> Good scene. <you> <laughs> and uh, I just like to read a phrase here that says how I felt and what, how I feel now. This is by Khalil Gibran, hmm. speak to us of teaching, and he said, no man can reveal to you aught but that which already lies half asleep in the dawning of your knowledge. And if he is indeed wise, he does not bid you enter the house of his wisdom, but rather leads you to the threshold of your own mind. And that is really saying how I feel about the mentoring. My whole life really was a preparation for what I'm doing now in mentoring. I don't know whether I answered the question well or not. <laughs> you, an you answered it perfectly. And, and uh, we, will, we will start by following your lead. Uh, mentoring is important to both of you and, and to your work. And, and you led with an example of a person who you had an opportunity to, to, to mentor and shape and who's here in looking at you in a way where they're kind of following, following suit to, to your lead. And I'd like to do just that. Um, so we will, we, let, let's start with talking more about mentorship. Why is that 
Why is that important to you? Um, and when did it click for you that through your work, through your example, um, that people were looking to you and were following suit with the, the examples that, that, that you were providing? Uh, well, I'm not sure how to respond to that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I, I need to put something on the table here for everyone. This guy's an oddball. Trust me. Um, growing up very poor on the west side of Chicago, I got a concussion in sixth grade that directed the rest of my life. It mixed up my mind. I was knocked out by half a brick that was thrown across the street at somebody else. And to this day, I have those issues. Now, I'm almost 86 now. It didn't. It didn't do away with my memory. It just mixed it up, up where I was not sure what I would or would not remember. So I started doing something that became, years later, the core of my mentoring program. And that's what we put on the boys because they're in the news every day. Um, said, I can get confused. See, so I need this guy to always keep me on track here. Um, because I had no one back in the 40s to listen to me, to understand what I was going through, um, I dropped out of high school. And that's relating to the mentoring also, because Douglas High School has our highest dropout rate now. And my job is to try and bring that number down. So I can get off on a point and forget where I was. So you have to bring me back. We're here. We're here together. Where was I? <laughs> uh, no, serious. That's that's serious business. My 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 son and my daughter and my grandson that they're here also. I'm just proud of all the folks that I see here that I recognize. Thank you all. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, photography came in after my involvement with psychology. And psychology is still the cornerstone of where I am now. Quite as it's kept, I don't have a formal piece of paper on that. But that's where my head and heart is. Um, joining the military to get out of the neighborhood is what saved my life. And that allowed me, after several years of being there, to begin to do what I never did before, and that was to read. I wanted to know more about anything that got more of my attention, attention. And from that, that's when I concluded that I wanted to get out and get a degree in psychology so that I could help people who are having mixed up minds that I was having. And uh, this typical C student became an A student in college, mm. majoring in psychology using what has become the core of our mentoring program now. And that is being curious about anything that gets your attention so that you can know more about it so that if you have to deal with it, you become normal. That's how I was thinking of it. But at any rate, um, I became an A student in college doing what I just described. But at a point I became depressed after several years of study, this is personal. By this time, I'm married. Um, I discovered or came to the conclusion that some of the best minds in psychology were not out there to help us. They were being employed by some of the corporations and some of the politicians to understand how we think so that they can control and own us. And I decided I didn't want to pursue that any longer. Now, this steps out of line with the graphics. Um, but my wife asked me, how, do you, how are we going to make a living now? 
I said, well, why don't we do what Jared Butler and Curtis Mayfield are doing? Those are West Siders like us. They're making money in the music business. And she laughed and said, fool, you need talent for that. <laughs> Well, I said, if Jerry Butler, see, I view them as just regular guys, because I knew them. One of my blood brothers, believe it or not, Jerry Butler, married sisters. That's how close we were. And I'm bowling every weekend with Curtis Mayfield. You know, these are regular guys to me. So I did my thing again. I reached out, shook some hands. I wanted to know more about things. Uh, I researched as best I could until I came up with the conclusion that, hmm, we could make some money um, or a living in music publishing. I explained to my wife how that worked, and we started in that. Compressing all of that, one thing led to the other with me doing what I was doing. We ended up with a recording contract with the largest record company at that time, ABC. I couldn't play or sing, but I understood how the parts worked to the point where I could put them together to be successful with it. And that's my mentoring program. Everything comes back to that because I may get off point now, but this is the core. I want you guys to think about this. I'm nothing more than an advocate hmm. for the men teams. That's how we refer to them, not men team. They are M-A-N-T-E-E-N-S. That's how we refer to our, our male um, students that, that we deal with. And we don't deal with them like anybody else that I know. Two of us works, work with um, eight boys. In the beginning, we did it a whole classroom, but research and everything over time said you want to be the most effective that you can, limited to four to one. So what we do is two of us with eight that way, if we if somebody can't make it because of, I got a doctor's appointment or something, um, you still can go on. And for those 15 years, believe it or not, we have never missed one session. Mm. But anyway, um, what point was I? Where was I? You're talking about the core of the core of your men, the the mentorship program. Okay, what and, is it? what did I say? You were you were what I would what I wanted to reflect back to you, if I may. Um, is what I'm witnessing right now. What I'm witnessing and what I'd like for you all to take a moment to note is the audacity, the audacious nature of someone to care enough about themselves. That in the midst of all of the things that they, that, that in all of the challenges that they face, that they care enough about themselves, that you care enough about yourself. You have to That you are there. willing to not sit in the midst of the challenge, not sit in the midst of the thing that, not even sit in the midst of, of, the, of what may be considered your own deficiencies. Oh. And to say that I am yet worthy of the pursuit of my dreams, that I am yet worthy of the pursuit of my ideas. And even though I have these challenges, I'm willing to go and find a way. And that I want to say out loud to you in response to the things that I'm hearing, because that in and of itself is and modeling that and giving people permission and inviting them to do that for themselves. All of us have challenges. Yeah, exactly. All of us are going through different things. All of us have hurdles that we have to jump. But what I think is a, a beautiful model of mentorship that we're witnessing and experiencing right now, in this second, live, in real time, is someone who has the audacity to say that I'm still worthy of that pursuit and I'm going to do it. I'm going to make the incremental steps and figure it out along the way. And that invitation, if we just accept that, is worthy of following and pursuing and is, for me, is at the core of what I think a good mentor is in any shape, form, fashion, time. And um, I get to bear witness to it tonight. And so do we by just hearing that story. Thank you so, so much. I, 
I'd like to turn to, to you and, and since we're on the topic of mentorship, we'll we'll come back to, to some other things. But let's 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 talk about about mentorship and well it's yes, and and from the perspective of a bearing witness, mm -hmm. in one of my books that Gordon gave me. Gordon, who is that? Who who Gordon, might you be referring to? Gordon Fox. <laughs> Uh, it, he and they don't know who Gordon Parks is. So yeah. they, I had some students in class one time, and I said James Brown. They didn't know who it was, so they might not. <laughs> they might not know who Gordon. Gordon, Gordon Parks, Parks to me was one of the greatest photographers ever. All right, he was. Okay. And, and 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 he was a a great mentor to a lot of people too. All right, even those who never met him. All right, because he wrote so many books and did so many other things. But um, uh, Gordon wrote in the book, uh, In Memory of the Good Old Hectic Days. And um, on one of those hectic days where, you know, a lot of people, we used to run around shooting in New York, you know, New York was always up and shoot. And uh, on one of those hectic days, Dr. King was assassinated. And um, a couple of days later, Gordon, Gordon was the creative director. A lot of people don't know it. He was the creative director of Essence Magazine. So I went over to his office, and um, I was going to school at the time at New York Institute of Photography. And uh, I went over to Gordon's office and I said, you know, I said, all of the media is talking about we're free at last and we're free at last. And I guess that was part of them trying to keep everybody from burning the country down. But, you know, everybody knew we weren't free at last. Uh, um, and I said to Gordon, I said, look, I, I'm just going to document black people for 10 years. And Gordon looks at me and, you know, he did his mustache like mm -hmm. this. And he looked at me and he, uh, he said, well, James, it sounds like you got a plan. He said, but your ass is going to starve. <laughs> he, said, he said, nobody's going to pay you to just run around shooting whatever it is you want to shoot. I said, no. I said, but I'm going to New York Institute of Photography. I'm going to get a piece of paper and I'm going to teach photography, and I'm going to do my documentary work. He said, well, sounds like you got a plan. 20 years later, in 1988, Sue took some pictures of me that, that day. Who is Sue? Sue Roy yeah, right there. Give it so up she, for her. For, 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 she was the, the photo grill. Yes. Who told me one day when I, I said, look, I'm putting together an exhibit of people who had never did an exhibit before. He said, well, I'm not a real photographer, a real photographer. I said, yeah, I know, but you're going to put, a, put some pictures in this exhibit. It's me because I told them already that you're going to put some pictures in yeah. <laughs> All right? And she became a real photographer. Mm. Okay, that's mentorship. Y'all know okay. that. <laughs> so, so anyway, they had the first National Black Arts Festival, and uh, the Apex Museum was on the second, first, and second floor. And so, Crystal Britton, for those of you who don't know, was a very great curator in Atlanta, who passed several years ago. Uh, she wanted to put together an exhibit of my music photographs. And so she went to Dan Moore, who's the owner and director of the Apex. And uh, uh, he said, yeah, we'd love to have this show. So Gordon came to my opening. And uh, I was surprised to see him come in, him and Ossie Davis and Bill Dupes and Bud Smith. Raise your hand, Bud. He yeah. came in with me. All right. Okay. 
And he made me walk him through the whole 60 pictures. Jordan made me walk him to every picture, 60 of them. And when we finished walking through the pictures, he said to me, now he always called me Jane. Didn't like it, but I, I accepted it from him and my mom and dad. <laughs> and, uh, so don't and, try <laughs> after the show. And Gordon uh, turned to me and he said, this was the last picture we looked at. It was a big picture, 45 inches long. And Gordon turned to me and he said, well, Jim, you ran around and shot what you wanted to shoot. He remembered what he had said to me 20 years earlier mm -hmm. about my ass starving, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, the, the whole idea of mentorship to me and bearing with me mm -hmm. is being serious about it. I have a loosely the organized group of girl photographers that I know that I call the, the, the friends of Jim. <laughs> um, and I gather up some of them from time to time and we go and document something that needs documenting from a cultural perspective, all right? Uh, last year, I got, I guess, about eight photographers, and I took them to Tunica, Mississippi, to document uh, people who do uh, blues music in the traditional way. Black blues musicians. This guy has an organization called Just Blues, J-U-S, Just Blues. Um, we have one of those people here. Raise your hand, lady. <laughs> Raise it high. Just <laughs> Angela. Uh, she, she was one of those eight people that I took down to document that event. She weaseled her way out of it <laughs> right there. Raise your hand back there. Hi. <laughs> she right? she we, weaseled her way out of it. But we had a good time. All right? And we got a real, did, did a really great job of documenting that event. And bearing witness means that what you're witnessing has, has to have some continuity to it. Mm. Got to have continuity. If you run out and document something and it's something that's going on and on and is never documented again, okay, goes away. Mm -hmm. right? Whenever somebody used to call my house or come by the house looking for me and everything, Jim is running and shooting. That's what she said. Jim is running and shooting. All right? Uh, somebody had told me about these brothers and sisters from here. The, the first group was from his hometown, Chicago. They went to Africa, and from Africa, they wheedled their way into Israel. They said they were black Hebrew Israelites. What happened was, they established themselves when they went from Africa, little by little, into, in, into Israel, and they set up a family there in different cities in Israel. And some people there, some of the Israelis, put the word out that the children were being starved, they were being beaten, they weren't being educated and so on and so forth. So one of the people that I knew who was a part of the group that I used to know in New Haven, Connecticut, got in touch with me and said, look, I talked to Prince Asiel Ben Israel 
who was the national spokesperson for the black Hebrew Israelites, that particular group. And I told him that you were a great photographer and we should bring you over here to document what we're doing. So he did. Prince Asiel Ben Israel came to my house and asked me if I would go over and document what's going on there. I said, sure. Yeah, I'll do it. I went over there and I stayed for two weeks and I documented what was going on. Whenever I wanted to go to the store, a little boy who was seven years old spoke three languages. He would go with me to the store so I could get what I wanted to get. They had dance programs, they had history programs, you name it, they had it all. And the best food in the world. First time I ever had barbecue beets. <laughs> <laughs> Never found anybody could make them again, you know. But anyway, I'm saying bear in witness, okay? When I came back to the United States, I went to three cities and document and showed the slides and did a slide presentation of the work that I've done that I've done. All right? I shot about 47 rolls of film in that two weeks, all slides. I went to Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Georgia, and Chicago and did the slide presentation of what was happening there with those people. And needless to say, you know, that put the kibosh on all of this thing about children dying and stuff like that, okay? And there was um, some other people who were there at the time uh, that I was there, some black and white people from different cities who happened to come there for, on a visit. And the name of the group was BASIC, Black Americans in Support of Israel Committee. All right. And so I like to see reality in your politics, okay? Be for real, okay? I worked then, I went to New Haven, Connecticut, and met a gentleman here when he was a freshman, right there. That professor right there. All right? Okay, yeah, all right. I was up to New Haven, I, I, there was a young lady I met up there. And so I was back and forth between New Jersey and New England. And I was working with Mary Baraka and a lot of other radicals in an organization, all right? Um, and it was called CAP, Congress of African People. And we were dealing with African Liberation Day and all of these different things. Um, and I met this gentleman in Newark one day uh, who was an architect and, um, in, in New Haven. And um, I was doing pictures after the 67 riots, if you would, in New York, and then again in New uh, in, 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 Well, in 67 is when they burned up everything, you know. All right? And uh, one of the things we were talking about, well, we were riding around on a flatbed truck one day, and they said, well, it's still community. You know, we can do this. We can do these are the same people burning up. You know? <laughs> and so, uh, Model Cities was having a meeting. Model Cities was one of the programs, you know, that they were going to use to try to calm everything down. We're going to give you all this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to do that. A lot of y'all remember that, right? Mm -hmm. 
Right, bro? <laughs> okay, so what happened was a couple of years later, they still hadn't done anything. Uh, but New Haven had a little fire too. And New Haven uh, at Yale, Yale started a program, we call it the program out of, they came out of the, out of the riots at Yale. Uh, they would take students who had a degree, black students, and graph, graphic design and architecture and everything like that. You could, they would give them a dual master's degree in urban design and urban planning. planning. Paid, all right? So they had a lot of really dynamic people who came from Howard and Tuskegee and programs that had architecture programs there. And um, this architect who I met at Model Cities in Newark came to me and said, look, remember what you were talking about, documenting all of these burnout buildings and then showing how they could still have, because they had all those stone buildings there, brownstones and all that, and they could still leave the facades of those buildings, and when they were finished with it, they would still have a sense of community, something like what in Dominica would do, raising their hey, this is a community builder right there. <laughs> all right? And he said, suppose you taught photography in this program at Yale. All of the students say, yeah, you know, we didn't need them to have teach party. So with my little eighth grade education, I started teaching in a dual master's degree program. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and since that time I've done it Clark, Mark Brown, everywhere else, sorry. It's I'm going to pause you right yeah, here, Mama. At, 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 at Clark and Morris, but we, we got to save some for Brother Tom. Your brother I'm, getting, I'm getting out right now. <laughs> and so that was when I really, really got into mentoring. Okay. There and everywhere else. Okay. We good. <laughs> I want, to ask you both, I want to ask you both a question. And we'll, we'll transition from this question into, into hearing some questions from the audience. And, 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 and I want to ask, start with, with asking you, from your work, for there's so much to learn. There's so much across your body of work for people to learn about you and to learn about themselves. I, I, I'd like to ask you as we're transitioning out, what... What do you hope that people learn through your work about you? And what do you hope that people learn through your work about themselves? The work that's on display here is easy. Okay, let's talk about it. Um, that depicts where I grew up. And none of, of what you see on those photographs exists today, by the way. Um, that was my depressed time. That's why it was photographed in black and white versus color. Mm. Um, it was a self-assignment. This was to depict how I felt about what I was photographing. And the only reason that I'm in here talking to you now with those photographs on display is because I was convinced that this, based on the success that I've had throughout my life after that, that someone else could benefit from it. Mm. That made the difference, period. Because um, it was something that he said that, that, see, if I don't write things down, it goes away. You should see <laughs> my notepad, seriously. But that's what I put on the boys that I mentor them because I'm finding that they don't read well, they don't research well, they are easily sold. If it's, 
if it says or shows anything that's, hey, I like that or that's what I want, whether it's the best thing, the most, that's what I'm going to do. And this is why we see the, we open up the newspaper, turn the TV on, somebody shot somebody over a chicken bone, you know. Uh, that's important to me. I'll be doing and be dealing with that until I'm not here anymore, period. Um, that music thing, I got a platinum award for that. This was the name. Who's the person that uh, sampled something? Wow. Erica Badu. Erica Badu. Yeah. Um, one time, one time. Give it up, that's fine. After two children, my wife, without her, I wouldn't be here talking to you. That was the biggest blessing in my life. She suggested that we needed to reconsider that music industry, knowing what we knew about it at that time. She said, if we stay in it, it's going to destroy our family. And I'm thinking money. <laughs> but she put that in my head. And it filtered everything that I touched from that point on until I came to the same conclusion that she did. And I decided to go with my family. And we severed all formal relationships with the music industry. And for nine years, I worked full time at the post office with good benefits, good paycheck. And I got bored with that at, you know, in my mid thirties. <clears throat> And everybody was saying, well, what, what, what do you want to do now? I said, well, as a kid, I used to draw and paint all the time just to stay out of trouble. Because you see how fat I am? <laughs> when I joined the military, I had gotten all the way up to 125. <laughs> <laughs> I was bullied and all the stuff. But looking back, everything in there, all the stuff that I used to cuss at, why me? Every bit of it was necessary mm. to get me to this point. That's, you know, the stuff is simple when you understand it. And when you don't, the simplest things are very complicated. Mm. And, that, and, you know, and that's what caused the problems in the world today. Ethics is the core of our program. And that goes back to my wife and our children. Um, I, I know I got off point. You bring me back to speed again. One one of the things that 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 you said that I'm gonna uh, is a lesson that I learned and that I will take from your body of work. That was the question. One thing that that teaches me about you and that can teach me about myself. And um, what you talked about that I'm gonna offer back to you um, from what you said was that. All of the things that I went through were necessary for me to be where I am today. And I'm going to connect that to what one can learn from your, your work and from your latest exhibit in particular, that it was created during a time where he was depressed. It was created, it was shot in black and white for these reasons. And when you see, I invite you to please go to Carlos and look at this exhibit and, and, and think about the context that it was created. And know that the lesson that you should learn from it is that in the midst of that depression, in the midst of that Chicago portraiture, in the midst of the things that you were going through at that time that are shown and depicted through that work, that they were one thing that we can learn is that they were your understanding is that it was necessary for necessary. you to be where you are today. And we are so grateful that you are where you are today and that we are here with you to be able to witness it and to be able to celebrate it. And we just please join me in giving a round of applause for all that had to be gone through for you to be where you are right here. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you the same question and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna leave with this or we're gonna invite people to ask maybe a question or two from this. When we look at your work, what do you want for it to, what do you, what do you want for your work to teach us about who you are and about who we are when we look at it? I did a program at Yale one time and they wanted me to make a statement 
to go on a postcard. That they were going to send out. And my statement was, it is very important to document who you are mm -hmm. and the things that you do so that you will have input into historical evolution and have a voice in the importance of that statement. Mm. So that's what I, you have to document your own stuff. Mm. Okay? Yeah. And we appreciate one more round of applause for documenting our stuff and letting it bear witness to the truth of who we are, where we were, that we were here, that we loved, that we felt, that we are beautiful, that we struggled, and we appreciate you so much. Y'all join me in giving both of these legends a round of applause for the witness and hell, for the mentorship they offer, for the guidance. Thank you so, so, so much. Do we, someone who can tell me whether or not this is true, do we have time for a question or was that round of applause our <laughs> no no let's take okay. one or two questions okay. hello how are you guys today um my question my name is umar i'm um, originally from sierra leone west africa i grew up in detroit michigan but um, with both of your careers in photography and documenting um, not only your lives, but the lives and the struggle of African-Americans throughout your lifetime, uh, what would you say is the biggest, um, uh, what would you say is the biggest or most influential moment that you photographed, that you photographed and why? Uh, for, for me, it was the establishment of the Duke Ellington Fellowship at Yale University that two uh, musicians who also taught history, um, Willie Ruff and um, Dwight Mitchell, they established it at Yale University and brought 25 um, musicians, uh, the, the older brothers, U.B. Blake and all of those people, as well as the whole Duke Ellington Orchestra there. And they were there for three days, and I got to document them. So mm. that was the greatest thing in my life. Mm. And then that was in 1972. And I climbed the telephone pole in 1974 to document his funeral. Mm. Yeah. All right. So if you, if you come to my studio, you can see those pictures side by side, and they're about 48 inches long. Earl, uh, the, uh, the Duke Ellington Orchestra, as well as um, Duke Ellington's uh, funeral, and, and the picture next to it. Mm -hmm. Let's get let's get one more question. No. Hi. I, 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 I'd like, if you can, um, I'd like to hear this other voice and we'll let uh, Mr. Dorsey answer this question. Thank you. Hi, yeah, so mine is it's not a question, but it's just a quick comment. I wanted to, to, to thank these legends uh, for being on the program today. This is wonderful. And you, Mr. Mackey, I, don't I wanted to good. say. Can this, you speak up a little bit? Sure. Can, can, you, hear can, can, can you hear me now? I just I wanted to thank the, these legends for being on the program this um, evening, and just to say that as we know that photography has not always been in vogue, mm -hmm. you know, like it is now as a fine art form. But I remember um, I grew up in Atlanta, Frederick Douglass High School, graduated in 1984. And I remember Mr. Dorsey um, seeing classmates, you know, who I would refer to as the the beautiful people, you know, the regular ones of us would have our photographs <laughs> taken by you know, the, the school, but these gorgeous photographs that you took of some of my classmates. And, you know, um, Mr. Alexander, I've you know seen a lot of your work over the years and what you said about documenting our stuff and the way, Mr. Dorsey, you documented, you know, these people in such a, I mean, it was just like, oh my God, this photograph is gorgeous. So thank you so much, both of you for all you know, of the wonderful work that, that you have done over the decades. You're welcome. 
and let's let's take let's take one more, and if we could if we could uh, if we could have you answer, it, Mr. Dorsey. Uh, there's, I'll give you my mic. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mr. Dorsey. I actually have a question for you. You did so much work with portraiture. What can we understand from the fact that this exhibit has so few people in the images? I wanted it to be cold. I wanted it to be real. Um, that was my downtime. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why it's titled what it was titled. Very incomplete self-portrait. Mm -hmm. And um, the rest is today. But I'd like to get back to the high school graduates. Um, my success in photography here would not have happened without them. Mm -hmm. I said straight up. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any of the people that I ended up getting credit for photographing, name, who's who. I didn't know any of those people. Those high school graduates brought them into the studio and introduced us to them. They were the beginning of my blessing to be a blessing. Mm. All the parts just fit together, you know. I don't know. You just, I can just thank the man upstairs. Thanking the man upstairs, thanking you all, thanking each person um, who had anything to do with tonight's gathering. What you went through was necessary for you to be here today. The witness that you bear with your work, inviting us to see ourselves through your documentation. I often say too much uh, when talking about the role of the artist is to translate the longings of the hearts of the people so that when we see ourselves, we see that these artists, these magicians, they gave us a vision of ourselves that allows us to be able to feel and see ourselves in it. You all have done that in so many important ways. You all continue to do that through your work and through your example. Um, tonight has been an opportunity for us to literally sit at your feet and listen and learn. We are so grateful. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you all for this opportunity to be able to have this conversation. Um, please visit the exhibit uh, as you leave Creative Justice. Please take time to come back and see an incomplete portrait of self. And thank you all so, so, so much. Thank <laughs> you.